All right, so welcome everyone and thanks for coming. So today we have the pleasure to listen to Tung Nguyen from Western University, and he's going to speak on the arithmetic of generalized Pekete polynomials. Please, Tung. Yeah, thank you very much for the introductions and thanks everyone for coming. So um, I want to thank the organizer again for giving me the opportunity to present my talk. So my talk will be uh, focused quite a bit on the arithmetic, but there will be some maybe some analytical aspect that people are interested in. So I will talk about the arithmetic of generalized forget polynomials. So here's a plan of my talk. But first of all, I will talk about uh, some motivation for the problem, why we became interested in this problem. And then I will talk about uh, what is a generalized forget polynomials, as the title said. And then I will talk about some Gawa theory for generalized forget polynomials. And if time permits, uh, we are down a little bit. I will talk about some connection to spectral graph theories. So this is based on my joint work with Jan Mina. He's a professor at Western University. And Nguyen Duy Tân is a professor in Vietnam. Mm. So this is a, a very serious work on, on this one. And then this is just, just one talk about one particular topic. So let me recall some basic definition from number theories. So Degelay characters is a simply a group of morphism from the unit group of Z mod D to C cross. And D here called the modulus of the conductors. And we say that kind of primitive. If it doesn't factor to some you know, small quotient, Z mod D for some D, which is divisor of D, right? So, so we say that it's primitive because um, basically it's the best thing you can do. And then usually what we do is that we extend a regular characters to an arithmetic function from Z to C by the following conventions. So if A and D are relatively prime, then chi of A equal to chi of A mod D. And if A and D are not relatively prime, then I just declare that chi of A equal to zero. And one advantage of doing this one, uh, doing this convention is that I can define what is called the L function of the characters. So the f function has the following infinite series form. It's a chi of n over n to power s, where n from one to infinity. So in the case where chi is just a trivial, the principal characters, meaning that chi of n equal to one for all n, this is exactly the classical Riemann data functions. And it's a, probably the first data function to appear in the, in the literatures. And so here, we say some fact about the L functions. The first thing is that the L function will be absolutely convergence if the real part of S is bigger than one. So, so that is some result from harmonic series, or maybe calculus one. And then furthermore, if chi is a primitive characters, then this one have an analytical continuation to the entire complex plane. So when chi is a principal character, we know that the Riemann data function can be metamorphically continuation, but it have a pole at s equal to one. But when chi is primitive, then, then we can uh, have an analytic continuation to the whole complex plane. So that's uh, the difference. So here's, here's the starting of our project. So we have an integral representation for the L functions given by the following formula. So you take the gamma function times the L functions. Then this one is given by the integral of this form, where the most important thing here is a polynomial f of chi of t, and it's given by the fol following formulas. f chi of x will be the sum from a from a from one to d minus one. So recall that d is the modulus of the characters. You take chi of a times x to the power a. Uh, so when we first work on this problem, for some chi, some special chi people know how to do some trick trigonometric substitution to compute this one elementarily. So we try to do the same thing for other chi. Um, so that is the starting of, of this project. And maybe I will talk a little bit about some historical fact about, about this one. So the first thing I want to say is that Michael Furkit, he up, observed that if chi is a real character, so that means he takes the value zero, one, or negative one. And F chi have no real zero on the integral from zero to one. And you can see that the function here doesn't change size on the interval from zero to one. So when you take the integral, then it's always non-zero. So in other words, the L function, we have no real zero for S bigger than zero. 
And so, uh, so I think people in, in, in the analytical number theory know that a uh, zero close to one equal to zero zero. So at least in this particular case, uh, theorem states that they know zero zero near near one. And then he conjecture that if you take chi of p to be the quadratic character associated with the Lejeune symbol, uh, so then he conjecture that the polynomial have no real root between zero and one. So therefore, they know zero zero. Um, so when I first worked on the project, I made the same mistake. So what I did in, in, in at the beginning is that I observed this polynomial, but I didn't know its name. So I'm using MATLAB and I plot the figure of this one. And I observed that for P less than 43, the curve is always above or below the, uh, the over the interval from zero to one. So in other words, it confirmed the conjecture of Fergit. So I thought that, okay, so this may be interesting. I made that conjectures. And then uh, maybe a few weeks later, my collaborator told me that, uh, so this is a known polynomial. People have studied for a long time and he showed me the counter examples. Um, so I think the first counter example, the he due to drop Poya, and he showed that the conjecture is for, for P equal to 67, and in fact, for infinitely many other primes. And it matters is very simple. So I think he just used a intermediate value theorem to, to, to find the set of the P that, you know, falsify these conjectures. So that is the starting of this, of this project. So now let me recall again the definition of the Fergit polynomial. Suppose that you have a Euclid character of modulo d, the Fergit polynomial is given by, by this sum. Uh, and it turns out that there are many studies in the literature that study many aspects of this polynomial. So for example, because the coefficient of this one is just zero, one, or negative one, it's a very good candidate to study some extremal properties like Mahler measures. And also people also use it to study the connection with the oscillation of quadratic L functions. And very recently, not very recently in terms of many, we can call recently about 20 years ago, there's a work of uh, Poonen and his co-author, he proved that uh, more than half of the root of this polynomial will be on the unit circle. And he have even formulated a very precise conjectures about the, the percentage of the, the root on the unit circle. And his method is, is very, very interesting, but at the same time quite elementary. So he used a theory of Gauss sum and intermediate value theorem to find the root. Um, and then to our surprise, we, we learned that there are very few work on the literature that focus on the arithmetic and the Galois theory of the polynomials. So we did some experiment with um, small p and then we observed some patterns. So we started to, to work to see you know, whether these patterns generalize to other prime numbers or with you know, just some problem of small prime, like just what happened with the root over zero one. So it turns out that the polynomial have a lot of patterns and we were able to discover some of them. But I think we believe that there's still a lot more work to be done about the polynomials. So today my talk will focus on the case where the kind of quadratic characters. So this is joint work with John and and Dunn. and and also recently we work on the case where chi is the principal Euclid character modulo modulo n, and so we have a new member to join the team Shiva Kidabaram. He's my friend at U Chicago, and he's a very very good at computational number theory. So we invited him to join the project. Uh, so in the, in the case in the second case then. The study is quite, quite elementary because you can see that if you study the principal Euclid character, then zeta values may not play a very important role. So the, the methods is different. So two papers related in the, in the sense that, that I just discussed, but the methods to attack them are very, very different. So, so I mentioned earlier, I will focus on the case of quadratic characters. So maybe I will start with building up what are those quadratic characters, can we classify all of them? So the simply type of quadratic characters coming from the Lejeune symbol. So the Lejeune symbol is given by the following conventions. So you have A over P, and this can be zero if P is the divisor of A. It can be one if A is square mod P, and it's negative one if A is not a square mod P. So here's a case, I assume that P off, okay, P2 is a little bit trickier, but we need to deal with it later. So that is the first and the simplest type of quadratic characters. And we can generalize this one. So um, the, the next generalization you call the J could be simple. 
where you have the uh, symbol for O of A over B, where B could be a positive number, but it's positive. And the way we define that, we factor B into the product of prime numbers, and we define this symbol multiplicatively. So you have A over P1 to the power E1, corresponding to the first factor, and so on and so forth. So that is how we define the Jacobi symbol. And then the more general one is called the Kronecker symbol, where you add some additional rule regarding where with P is even and P is uh, equal to true, and then the case where you have to deal with the negative numbers. So those are called auxiliary rules. So for example, A over two is zero if A is even. It will be one if A comes to one or negative one mod eight, and if negative one it comes to three or negative three mod eight. So now using the additional rule, we can define the connector symbol for any, any, any number A over B. And we define it using the factorization of N and using the multiplicative rule that I just mentioned. So here you have A over psi of N and A over P1 you know, and A over P2. So the second pass corresponds to the Jacobi symbol and taking into account the K over P equal to number two. So, I think, um, so maybe I want to end this one by saying that basically the correct symbol classify all primitive quadratic characters. So every quadratic character have to be of this form. So let me now connect this study to the very classical study of quadratic fields. You know, we have quadratic characters coming from the quadratic fields. So let's say here we have a D, which is square free integers. And I call delta to be the discriminant of the quadratic extension where you add join root of D to Q. So in this case, using the, an integral basis for this uh, Andrew extension, we can compute that the discriminant of this one equal to D, if D comes to one mod four or four D, if D equal to two or three mod four. So in this case, you have the characters given by the chi of delta A, equal to the conical symbol a, delta over a. And so here we can show that it's the primitive characters. It only takes value net one and negative one or zero. So it, a real characters. And then is a theorem saying that if you have real and primitive characters, it have to be to be of this form. So um, one thing I want to say here is that um, maybe I want to go back here. So A over P tell you whether A is a prime number, A is square mod P or not. So the Jacobi symbol doesn't tell you A is a square mod B or not. Uh, but on the other hand, this character here tell you how this number, how to, you think about A is a number, but at the same time, it's an ideal. It tell you how you factor when you take the extension from Z to Z, a joint root of D. So that is the main meaning of this symbol. So now, so let me just come back to the classical definition of forget polynomial. Here I want to change the notation a little bit, to get it easier to write, and also look uh, more elegant. So we know that the character is completely determined by deltas. So it makes sense to index the polynomial by deltas. So I will define f of delta x equal to uh, exactly the forget polynomial. It takes the sum from a from one to d minus one, which is the modulus of the characters and chi of a times x to the power a, and explicitly given by this connector symbol on the right-hand side here. So again, so the k where delta is a prime number, it will study uh, by Firkit. So Firkit introduced this, uh, these polynomials. And then our work here focus on the arithmetic and the Galatiotic properties of those so polynomials. So that is uh, the main focus of, of the work. Yeah, so let me start by giving you some very concrete example about, about the polynomials. So let's take a look at the example where delta is equal to negative 15. So in this case, if you use shake math, you can see that the polynomial factor in the following form. So first of all, you only have the factor x because by definition, and then you have the factor phi one, which is the first uh, cyclotomic polynomial, which in this case, x minus one, and you have phi three, so phi three is the third cyclic polynomial. So I think x squared plus x plus one, and you have phi five. So the rest is just a polynomial. It turns out that this polynomial is irreducible. And furthermore, what we can say about that is that it is a reciprocal polynomial. So you take the coefficient of x to the power six equal to the coefficient of x to the power zero. 
the coefficient of x with power phi, which is zero, equal to the coefficient of x, which is also zero, so on and so, so forth. So this is a very symmetrical polynomial. So the k delta i to 21 is very similar. So you have x times phi one, but instead of having phi one, it's phi one square. Then you have phi two, and you have phi three, and you have c phi seven, and you multiply with another symmetric polynomials. So the same thing you can say can be said about this polynomial. So here you, you can see that the maybe you can already observe the coincidence that you have three coming from the factors. You have five also coming from the factors. Here you also have three coming from the factors, and you have seven coming from the factors. So maybe that's the first observations. And now, so in the two previous examples, I took the case where uh, delta is odd. Delta is even a little bit, a little bit different. So let's take a look at the delta equal to seven. In this case, take equal to 44. So in this case, let's go back to the definitions. So in this case, what you see is that when delta is even, then in this sum here, we only take the sum where a is odd. Otherwise, the correct simple will be zero. So if you take x out, the remaining will be just even power. So in other words, the polynomial will be a polynomial in x squared instead of a polynomial in x. So, so in this case, what happened is exactly that. So we have phi one, but instead of having phi one of x, you have phi one of x squared. And instead of having phi two, you have phi two of x squared and so on and so forth. So you have phi 11 of x squared. And finally, you have a polynomial in, in x squared. So you can see here that the polynomial is reducible. And furthermore, it also reciprocal. So now here I want to introduce these uh, definitions. So we need to modify the polynomial when, when delta is even. Um, and the way we define it is the following. You take the factor x out and the rest can be a polynomial in x squared. So we only care about the, so we consider it as a polynomial in x. So in other words, I define f tilde is given by, by this formula over here. So a very concrete formula. So the, the advantage of this convention here is that you can talk about factorization of f tilde instead of talking about factorization of f, f, f delta. So in this case, you can see that f tilde have factorization, but um, the, mm -hmm. the Bible will be x instead of x squared. Yes, so now I will explain the zero of these polynomials. It's explained very nicely by the theory of Gaussian. And that is a case where you have to deal with uh, primitive characters. In the case where you have principal characters, in the theory of Gaussian will not have. So you have I mentioned earlier, you, we need different methods. Um, so here's the observation that we just made. I think from the example, you probably already see that if n is divisor of d, but n is not equal to d, then phi of n is a factor of f deltas. And the way we prove it is the following. Uh, we use the theory of Gaussian to, to prove it. Suppose you have b to be an integer, and I fix a primitive d root of unities. So in a complex number, you can take, take this, these numbers. And the Gaussian, you have two fact, you have two variables. First of all, you have the number b, and the second of all, you have the character chi. So we define as the following form. So you sum from a from one to d minus one, take chi of a, zeta d to the power ab. So you take a look at the definition of the Fourier polynomials. It is exactly the evaluation of the Fourier polynomial of theta d to power b. So when chi is primitive, uh, there is a fundamental property saying that basically the Gaussian is determined by the Gaussian when b is to one. And here's the factor here, the additional factor here, chi of, chi of b. So a corollary of this one is that if b is not relatively prime to, to n, to delta, then this guy will be zero. So the Fourier polynomial will vanish there. So in conclusion, the theory of Gaussian tells us that if you take zeta d to power b, so this one because the GCD of b and d is not one, so it's no longer a primitive d root of unities. So it can be a d root of unity, but it's not primitive. And this says that the, the, the polynomial will vanish at exactly this point. So that is a proof for the observation that if n is divisor of d, but n is not equal to d, then f delta of zeta n equal to, to zero. So that is a, the evaluation. So basically we can observe this one using the theory of Gaussian. So we ask ourselves the, the following questions. Suppose you have n to be a positive numbers, 
And the question is, what is the multiplicity of zeta n as the root of these polynomials? So here, what we want to say here is that uh, mm -hmm. the theory of Gaussian <laughs> predicts what happens when n is divisor of d. But in this question, we don't require that n to be a divisor of d. So I will show a later that there will be the case where, in fact, n may not be divisor of d. So those case, we call it exceptional zero. Um, so uh, to continue our investigation, we did not have delta phi n or have delta n to be the multiplicity of phi of n in, in this polynomial. So in other words, what is the multiplicity of a primitive n root as the root of the Fekit polynomials. Uh, so in this talk here, I will focus very exclusively in the case where delta i ought, but the, some methods, um, methods could be adapted to, case, to the case where delta I even a little bit, calculation a bit messier because we have to modify the Fekit polynomials. So maybe I will pause a second if, if people have any questions. I might go a little bit fast. So maybe I want to pause a second if people have any questions before I move to the next topic. Okay, so there are no questions. So let me continue. So the first proposition that we observe is the following. So, um, the simply type of cyclic term, cyclic term polynomial as of phi one and phi two, right? So here we completely determine the, the, the multiplicity of phi one. So phi one, we have multiplicity one if delta is less than zero. So in this case, the character is odd, but if delta phi one can be equal to two if delta bigger than zero. So in this case, the character is even. So an odd characters, if cap one is negative one, and it even if cap one equal to k of negative one equal to one. And at the same time, we can determine the multiplicity of phi two as well. So it can be zero if delta less than zero and be one if delta bigger than zero. So this is quite, quite a straightforward proposition. So I will explain the proof and also it will be, uh, will be used as a prototype for other arguments involving other, other, other n. So the idea here is that, so first of all, you want to say what is the multiplicity so the first thing you want to do is that you evaluate the polynomial at one. So you have f delta one, you can do the sum of chi of a, where a running from a from one to d minus one. And we know that is you have to be zero. So at least we know that is the root. So in order to study the multiplicity, we need to consider higher derivative of, of f. And the way we do that turns out very, very interesting. So we connect the following three topic. So first of all, we have higher derivative of the Fekit polynomials. We connect them to Bernoulli numbers. And from Bernoulli number, we connect them to special value of L functions. And when you come to the land of special value functions, you can say whether uh, that's vanished or doesn't vanish. Okay. So for example, using the functional equations. So in order to, to do that, let me recall very briefly, I think uh, this, the formula is very complicated, look messy, but in, in practice, it's actually very nice. Um, so the Bernoulli number is defined by the following infinite series. So you take the um, Taylor expansions of the left-hand side, and then you take the coefficient of the dn over n factorial. That gives you the generalized Bernoulli uh, numbers. And in order to define the Bernoulli polynomials, you uh, take this combination. So n over k times bk chi times x to by n minus k. So, so, so in other words, those are, the polynomial that we will use to study uh, data functions. So as I mentioned in my, in my previous slide, there is a notion of the L functions. And this L function can have an uh, analytical continuation to the whole complex plane. So it's okay for us to talk about special value with negative integers. So for example, you probably remember that the value of the Riemann data function is negative one equal negative one over 12. So this is a famous one. But for, for general character, we have the generalization as well. So this says that when you evaluate a function at one minus n, it's given by the Bernoulli number b n chi, and you divide by, by n, it takes a negative sign. So the corollary of this one using the functional equation for, for the zeta function is that b of zero chi can be zero, and it's corresponding to uh, l of n equal to zero, so L1. So, and then you have 
B of n chi is not zero if n congruent to the side of the characters. And if B zero is not congruent to the side of the characters. So that, that is a theorem. And then a, a standard reference for this one. So is a book of uh, Iwasawa. He have a very nice book on the, I think it's the title of the book, he lecture on periodic L function. So it, I think it is good in chapter, chapter one of this. And he made a very interesting comment that he, he doesn't know how to prove for example, B1 chi not zero. So it, not using zeta function. So even though the statement is very elementary, he says that he doesn't know how to prove that without using zeta values. So now we can, we can prove the, the theorem that I just mentioned. So in order to study the multiplicity, we take high derivative until it doesn't vanish anymore. So if you take the first derivative, you have chi A times A, and this by definition is exactly D times B with one chi. And then by the vanishing theorem that I just mentioned, it can be zero if delta is bigger than zero, but it's not zero if delta is smaller than zero. So when in the case where delta is bigger than zero, you have to take, continue to take the derivative and that you come to the second derivative. And if you take the second derivative, it's given by this formula over here, A times A minus one, chi A. And it turns out that because A times chi A, some of those are zero. So you end up with A squared times chi A. So in this case, d times the second Bernoulli numbers, but in, in this case, it will be non-zero because now the congruent will be changed, right? First, the congruent and the second one is shift. So this show that the multiplicity will be one if delta is more than zero, but it can be true if delta is, is bigger than zero. And the proof here, in fact, is true for any primitive character. It doesn't have to be, to be quadratic. Um, Yes, yeah, so I think that is the, the argument that I want to say. For phi of two, the method is the same. So you take the derivative and you take the evaluation and then you take the derivative. Um, so, so that's all I want to say about the case where you have very simple factor phi one and, and phi two. So now I will focus on some special case where you have to do more complicated calculations. So the first case that I consider is a foreign case where delta is three times p. Remember that the delta have, have to be congruent to one mod, mod, one mod four. So here you have to consider the case with p congruent three mod four. Right. So let's take some example of those op. So first of all, let's consider the case where delta is three times seven, be 21. So in this case, you have f of delta, you have the factor of x, that we know how to explain. We have phi one square, we also know how to explain by the previous theorem. V2, we also know how to explain by the previous theorem. V3, we know how to explain from the theory of Gauss sum. V7, we know how to explain using the theory of Gauss sum. And then what it remains is this reducible polynomial and it even reciprocal. And now the next interesting thing is the uh, case where delta to three times 11. So in this case, you have the factor of x, right? we know that. We have phi one square, we also know that. We have phi two, we also know that. This is a new, new, this is the new thing. We have phi six. Phi six cannot be explained by the theory of Gauss sum, right? Because six is not a divisor of deltas. You have phi three that was explained by the theory of Gauss sum. But the important thing here is that it's, instead of having phi three, you have phi t square. So this cannot be explained by the theory of Gauss sum completely. We know that phi three are factors but it doesn't predict the multiplicity. And then you have phi 11, which is predicted by the theory of, of Gauss sum. Yeah, so this, on this case, we see some, some phenomena, some new phenomena. And again, in the case where delta is three times 19, you have x, right? So this, we know, with phi one square, we know, phi two, we know, phi three, we know, and phi 19, we know. Uh, but then there are no other synchronic factors. So there's yeah, so a one remaining polynomial, but it's reducible and it's not cyclotomic. So now you took, let's take a look at the table here. Then I made the table for some various value, value of P. So when, so let us focus in the, in the K where uh, it's just a K phi tree because you know, you explain too much information, it has to follow. So let's take a look at the K of phi tree. So when P equals seven, the multiplicity is one. When it's 11, the multiplicity is two. When it is 19, the multiplicity is one. When it's 23, the multiplicity will be two. When it be 31, the multiplicity will be one. 
And in 41, 43, the multiplicity is also one. So maybe I, I want to pause the moment if people observe any pattern from, from this formula over here. So, so my question is for the audience, so what is a pattern that you can see from this table here? About? One or two model of three. So exactly. So the, the determination completely determined by what happened when P equal to one uh, more three or two more three, right? That is the theorem. So the theorem says that you have delta the three P and P equal to three mod four. Then the multiplicity of phi three and be one, if P equal to one mod three, it will be two if P equal to two mod three. And the same thing can be said about phi six. So the multiplicity of phi six will be zero. If P equal to one mod three, the one will be congruent to two mod three. So again, the proof of this one is, you know, using the techniques that I just mentioned. The first, in order to study the multiplicity, you first study the value. And then if zero, you take the derivative. And it turns out that in all calculations, the final answer will involve in boundary numbers. And in turn, will involve L functions. And when then you're learning the, the, the value of the land of zeta, zeta land, my advisor often call that. You, when you are in the zeta land, you can say something about whether it's vanished or it doesn't vanish. So this is very, very, very neat. And again, so now we, we need to make the following definitions. Uh, so we define the small f to be, you take the big F and you factor out all the cyclic factor that you can find. So in the case where P you two mod three, you have P one square, you have phi two, you have phi three square, you have phi six and you have phi P. And in the case where P going to one mod three, then you just simply have phi one, phi two, phi three, and phi P. So this will be the polynomial that we will consider. So basically we take out all the cyclic factors that we can find. And then the remaining is exactly the, the form of the forget polynomials. So here is a proposition, it's very straightforward. Uh, so all the cyclic polynomials are reciprocal. The big F is also reciprocal. So when you take your quotient, it will be reciprocal. So the first statement here is that F of delta X is reciprocal and it have even degrees. So degree is given by this formula and then you can obtain it from the formula over there. And now in the case where delta is to negative three P, so in this case, you want it to count to one mod four. So you have P going to one mod, mod four. So in this case, we can use the same methods. In the case where delta is less than zero, then there's no, no exception of zero, I would say, because in the proof, then there is some, the, the role of phi two is very important in the proof. So here we, we prove that the multiplicity of phi three and the multiplicity of phi P is exactly one. So the Fekit polynomial is given by, by this formula. So here I take negative F, F delta to make sure that is the monic polynomial. So meaning that the leading coefficient is one. And then you take the big F, you divide on the cyclic factors to get the, the small F. And that's gonna be the one we will, we will investigate. So again, here we can prove that it is a reciprocal polynomial. And the degree of this one is two times P minus two. So in particular, it can be an even numbers. So I think that is the first part of my talk, uh, basically about determining uh, the cyclic factor of F, the big F. And now I will focus on the Gawal theory of, of small F because uh, it's not very interesting to consider a cyclic factor. It doesn't give you new information, right? So what is important here is the small F here and what we can say about that. Yeah, maybe I, so this is the first part of my talk and I want to pause the moment if people have any clarifying question about, about it. Okay, so is there no question then let me, let me continue. So this is quite surprising for me. I didn't expect that when I first worked on the project. So, um, um, what I want to say here is that so my advisor, he, he observed that when, when P is small, maybe just seven, he can do it by hand. So he observed that the degree of the Galois extension is maximum. And we do that using magma. So we put the polynomial in magma, it tells you the size of the group. 
of the gal group, it doesn't tell you what group it is, but it tells you the size. And once you see that the size maximum, then you can say what it is. And then, so we try to do that for small p, so 7, 11, 13. But after, I think, 43, then we stop because the preno may get the degree too big. Magma cannot handle it. So we submitted the paper to a journal. So in the, and then the, uh, the, one of the editors said that this is not good because it's too small. You need to verify for bigger p. And so we think harder about how to approach the problems and we figure out one way to, to, to attack the problem. Instead of calculating the degree, there's a better way to compute Gauss group. So I will explain it in a second how, how, how that methods work. So maybe first thing I want to say here that is a crucial observation here that because F is a recipro reciprocal polynomial of even degrees. So basically you can write as a polynomial of X plus one over X. Right, so you have the extra factor of x divided to the, so basically it is the middle degrees. And then you pair them like x to the power 3 plus 1 plus x to the power 3. Then you can write as a polynomial of x plus 1 over x. So it's an elementary fact. So the polynomial g here, I call it the reduced forgive polynomials. And we contain all the information about f. But what a nice thing about this one is that the Gauss theory of f and g fit very well in the following sorry exact sequence. So first of all, I recall that f, if you have a polynomial f over q, q of f will be splitting field of the polynomials over q. So you are trying on the root of f to the, to the field, to the rational field. And here we have a short exact sequence. So first of all, in the quotient, you have the Gauss group of g over q. And this is a subgroup of Sn, where n is the degree of g. Right? So because Sn acting on the root of, of g, so it's naturally a subgroup of Sn. And then you have the quotient coming from the Gauss group of f, because that's the extensions. And then the kernel of the map is the Gauss group of f over q. But furthermore, you look into the definition. For a root of g, you have two root of f by solving the equation x plus one of x to u. So h root of this gives you a quadratic extensions. And you have n root of g. So this gives you z, and you give you n and quadratic extensions. So in other words, the Gauss group of f over g is naturally a subgroup of z mod 2 to power h delta, where h delta is the degree of g. Um, so in other words, the whole Gauss group of f over of, of f is a semi-direct product of z mod 2 to power h delta times the symmetric group on h delta elements, where you the s here acting on this uh, first component by just permuting the, the of the components. And furthermore, we can observe that uh, this semi-direct product is naturally a subgroup of S of 2H delta because um, F is a polynomial of degree of 2H delta, so the, the Gauss group will act naturally on the set of root, and they are exactly 2 times H delta root. So that's why the subgroup of this as well. So now I come back to the story of how we came back with the um, basically answer the request from the editor, adding more examples, adding more evidence for the conjectures. So here in the case where delta is just a prime number, we show that the Gauss group F is maximal. So that exactly the semi-direct product that I mentioned. And in particular, the Gauss group of G is also maximal. It's a symmetric group on H delta letter, where H delta is a degree of G. Um, so a very simple query of this one, which we don't know how to prove. We can prove using computer, but uh, find it not very, very convincing. So we here to prove that if p less than 1,000, then both of these polynomia are irreducible. A very simple fact, but I think it's still open. Uh, uh, we don't know how to, to prove that. And I think people in the literature also don't know how to, to prove that. Um, so now come back to the question of how we, we determine the Gauss group. So I mentioned earlier, when we work with small p, what we can do is that we compute the degree of the extension. So magma can do that. And when you observe that the degree is maximal, then you conclude that is is the everything. But here you cannot do this because for small big, big prime number p, then the degree increase very fast. So you basically have to deal with something like p factorials. And so we will start for a little bit. Um, and then I remember that when I was an undergraduate student, took a course in Gawa theory. 
And remember that uh, there is a very nice theorem saying that when the you take a random polynomial, then the gal group will be Sn. And the way we check that is that we can do reduction of f mod p. So when you have enough cycle tie in the in the gal group, you can conclude that the group is, is big enough. So um, the proposition is followed. And I can, so instead of saying this one, I can say the corresponding statement for the symmetric group. So you have a, sim, a subgroup of the symmetric group with each additive. I mean, you can take one element to another. It contains a two cycle, contain an n cycle, and it contains an n minus one cycle. Then there is everything. So um, you can translate this one into the statement about the factorization of G mod uh, prime number P. And one you find on the prime number P, we'd have, we'd have these three properties. Then we conclude that the Gal group can be, can be evidence. And that's going to be done very efficiently in, in shape map. So that is how we, we check that the Gal group of G, E, S, N. And so about the Gal group of, of F, then there's a classical theorem of, of Davis, Duke, and Soon. Uh, so basically, they, they say that um, if you also have certain type of cycle in your group, so the first thing is say that you have two n cycles. If you have uh, two n minus two cycle, if you have two cycle, and this is a two and four cycle, um, then so this two cycle and this is four cycle, then the GAR group will be a maximum way possible. So that is a semi direct product of D mod two to the power n times uh, Sn. So that is a theorem of Davis, Duke, and, and soon. So we apply the theorem in, in, in our project and we're able to, to verify for some small than P. For P less than 500, we were able to do that. But um, it's very hard to do for, for bigger, for B, which is bigger. And furthermore, we observe a very consistent problem is that when P equal to, when delta equal to negative three P with P equal to five or eight, and we found that is the guard group be never maximum. And it took a long, long time to figure out what happened because you know, we were expecting that the graph groups to be, to be maximal, but no matter how hard we try, we fail. So we thought a little bit about what, what happens. And then you observe that it turned out that there are some restrictions and this, um, that we call the exceptional symmetry that we didn't observe when we first work on that. We, we figured it out. So basically, the problem here is that when delta is negative three p, then the discriminant is a perfect square if p equal to five mod eight. So when the discriminant is a perfect square, we know that um, instead of being a subgroup of S n, the gal group is a subgroup of the alternating group. Right? So that is the restriction that we we missed. Um, so we figure out a way to to deal with this one. Um, so is the starting point is the following lemma. So as I mentioned earlier, you can consider the semi-direct product as a subgroup of S2N. And on S2N, you have the side map. The side map is very important to determine whether you are subgroup of SN or you subgroup of the alternating group. And then we have the following commutative diagram. So the side map, you know, the sigma here, basically you take the sum of all AI. So you don't worry what happened with sigma. You only worry about the sum of the component AI, AI here. And so the corollary of this one is that if this one is a perfect square, then the graph group cannot be maximal. It have to contain in the kernel of sigma, which is um, which exactly semi-direct product of Sn on the kernel of sigma prime here. So you take the component, but the sum of the component have to be zero. And S and still acting on that by permuting. So, so that is a, the restriction. So now we have the restriction. And the next question we have to ask, okay, so what happened? How do you determine that this will be the gal group in that case? So we, we come up uh, with some way to do that. But before I do so, then I make a very elementary observations. So the observation that we, we make here is that, so when the K with the discrimination is a perfect square, and we expect that F delta is reducible over Z, but in fact, it has to be reducible over F cube for all prime cube. And the reason is very simple. If it is reducible, 
Then the graph group will contain the two eight delta cycles. So this, this cycle is the odd cycle. So that's not good. So, so we found a family of example where you have a polynomial which is reducible over Z, but it's reducible over Q for, for any Q. So that is for me is quite interesting. So now I will explain some, some approach using group theory, how to attack the problems. Um, so um, the proof is very straightforward, but the statement it follows. Suppose that you have a subgroup of this semi-direct product. And I assume that the projection map from H to SN, so the second component is subjective. And furthermore, it contains a product of two cycles and a four cycle. Then it have to contain the kernel of sigma star semi-direct product with SM. So, so in order to, to do this, we can translate this one into a statement about factorization mod P. So you have a polynomial and it reciprocal, reciprocal of even degrees. And suppose that you can find the uh, following condition. So the discrimination of F is a perfect square. The Gal group of G, which is a choice polynomial, ESM. So this corresponds to the fact that the possession to, to SM is subjective. And you can find uh, prime numbers such that when you take the factorization, it gives you a, a product of a two cycle and a four cycle. Then, uh, first of all, the Gal group contained in this semi direct product. But again, the previous position say that it has to contain this one. So you have uh, inclusion in both directions. So the Gal group have to be have to be exactly this uh, semi-direct product. So that is uh, how we, we solve the problem. So <clears throat> let's take a concrete example about what happened when the k with delta is four times 19, so the k where delta is even. So we, in this case, we see that f of delta is given by this formula. And it uh, reciprocal. So the coefficient of active power 16 equal to the coefficient of active power 0, coefficient of active power 15 equal to the coefficient of active power 1. And so using shape map, you can show that the discriminant is a perfect square. Um, the graph group G in this case, you also add 8. And we compute this using the, the criteria that you have the transitive subgroup contain an n cycle and it contain. It contains an n minus one cycle and contain two cycles, contain everything. So that is how we compute that Gagu G is S8. And that key we could do 227. You can see that it contains a two cycle times a four cycle. So by the previous uh, theorem, we say that the Gagu F have to be exactly this semi direct product. So that is how we, we handle the case where the discriminant is a, the perfect square. Um, so now I want to revisit the criterion of uh, Duke, Davis, and Sun. It turns out that there's some limitation on that theorem because um, it cannot deal with it. In, in, in my case, it doesn't, doesn't give uh, a way to deal with the case where P is a big number. So we, we try to maybe improve it a little bit. And so we came up with the following lemma. So again, you have a subgroup of the semi-direct product. We, we can also consider as a subgroup of S2n. And I assume that the natural projection from S to Sn is subjective. And furthermore, I assume that H contains a two cycle. Then the Gal group of H have to be the semi-direct product. Right? So in particular, it contains an odd cycle. So it, it doesn't contain in the kernel of sigma prime that I just mentioned earlier, because those only contain the even even permutations. So, but here you have two cycles, so that's good. So you translate this theorem into a theorem about polynomial. And you say that if you have a monic reciprocal polynomial, even degrees, and let's say G is a choice polynomial. Um, so if the Gal group G is SN, so in other words, you have the subjective projection to SN, and you can find a prime number Q such that the factorization gives you a two cycle then the Gal group of F have to be exactly this semi-direct product. So it is a maximum as possible. And so uh, with this, uh, with this new, new lemma that's allowed to work with bigger P, then 
I show the following. So in the case where delta you have a few prime factors, 4p, negative 4p, 3p, negative 3p, then uh, we conjecture the following that if the discriminant is not a perfect square, then the guard group is maximal. So in other words, it's a semi-direct product of d mod to the power h delta times the symmetric group on h delta letters, where h delta is a degree of g. However, if the discriminant is a perfect square, then it uh, have to be the kernel of sigma star semi-direct product with s of h star. Um, so, um, so that is the conjectures. And using the two lemma that I just mentioned, we were able to verify this conjecture for p less than 1,000. So previously, we were able to do it up to uh, 500. Um, but now we can do it for 1,000. We can probably do more. But the running take, take a lot of time, so I decided to, um, to stop running on search. Um, so I think that's all I want to talk about for Git polynomial. I still have a few slides to talk about. Uh, but I don't know how many minutes do I, how many minutes do I have left? Uh, how long do you think, Jonathan? The next slide will be about maybe five or 10 minutes. Oh, as you wish. Uh, whatever you prefer. Okay, so let me continue to talk about this because I think it's quite exciting. So here we connect this study to spectral graph theories. And in fact, in the recent joint work with other mathematicians, for example, Maria Shashnovsky, we consider the case, generalize this one to any primitive, um, not primitive function, but primitive multiplicative functions over any rings we're able to say something about general Paley graph. So I think it's quite interesting. So uh, let me spend a few time to explain it. I'm very excited about uh, this one because we're able to connect something from number theory to spectral graph theories. So, so let chi to be the quadratic character asserted with delta that I just mentioned earlier. Then we construct the following graphs. We call the general Paley graphs. So the vertex of this graph has a number from zero to d minus one with the element from z mod d. And two vertex are connected. If the difference, when you evaluate the number chi here, equal to, to one. So in the case delta is just equal to the prime number, this is exactly the classical Paley graph. So you have the set of vertex is a set of elements from the finite field FP, and two vertex are connected if the difference is square. And that um, Paley graph has been used a lot in many different fields. So I think it's, um, it be nice to see whether you can generalize that to generalize Paley graph as I just mentioned. So, um, so this topic is connected to another topic that I find interesting called circling graph. Um, so basically the connection in P delta is determined by V minus U, right? So if you uh, write the other symmetric of this polynomial, it determined by what happened to the connection with the vertex zero, because you have the, uh, connection to zero, then you determine all the possible differences. So the first row will determine everything. Right? So it turns out that the other symmetric is a circling graph and the generating vector is chi of a times chi a plus one. So my explanation is for the very simple. So this value here will be zero unless chi of a equal to one. So remember it's a quadratic character. So chi of a is zero, one or negative one. If it's zero, then chi of a is zero. If negative one and chi of a plus one is also zero. So the only possible way for it to be one is chi of a exactly, exactly one. And that is the condition that you want to, to say whether it connected to zero or not. So we can easily see that the degree of this one is phi of d over, over two, because um, you take the number and then you ask how many of them chi of that number equal to one. So there are three D values where you have different, you have uh, one or negative one, right? But then half of them will be one and half of them negative one. So that's why the degree would be exactly phi of D over, over two. And then 
we can compute the spectral of this, of this matrix, what we call the spectral, uh, the circular diagonalization theorems. It says that the spectrum of this one is given by uh, lambda of deltas. When lambda of delta is this, it takes the entry time omega to power a, the omega run over the set of all d root of unities. So I will be very brief here. The sum have two terms. The first one is chi a omega to power a. That we due to the calculation of Gauss sum. The second sum is chi a square times omega a. The chi a square will be one if a and d are relatively prime, and it's zero if a and d are not relatively prime. So it turns out that the second sum also have a name. It's called the German region sum. So, um, and then both have a very concrete formula. So using this expression here, we will be able to find the spectrum of a P delta very explicitly. And so the theorem that we have here is that it describes explicitly the spectrum of this graph. So for x d, a divisor of d, but it's not equal to d, then you have this number, and it happened exactly phi d times. And when d equal to d, you have two more. So uh, this is given by, by this formula over here. And it's quite interesting to see that you, you have all the eigenvalues except these two, except the last two are integers. So the last two are not integers, but all the other ones are, are integers. So this gives a, a very generalized, a st a generalized statement for a classical Paley graph. So a classical Paley graph, we know the spectrum. And so if you apply to that formula, then you get, you get the formula when delta is just a prime numbers. And so the final topics that I want to connect and it have application in dynamics. We and so another topic that I'm very interested in is called the uh, Jamanujan graph. So you have a uh, connected regular graphs. Regular means that each vertex have the same degrees. It connect to the same number of vertex, other vertexes. And you can order the roots in the decreasing orders. So we know that lambda one have to be equal to one or equal to R because degree because the vector one, 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 one will be an eigenvectors. And we can also know that delta I is less than or equal to R. So it could be equal to negative R. I mean, that's a uh, bipartite graph, which is not very interesting. Okay. Interesting, but you have to work a little bit different. So I define lambda G to be the maximum in the term absolute value of all eigenvectors, including the to trivial eigenvector R or negative R. And the graph is called German illusions. If the lambda G is less than the two times R minus one. So this is particular, this is a class of expander graph that people study in, in practice. And the term German illusion here come from very interesting terminology. So it comes from the work of uh, Alex Lubowski, Peter Sarnak, and another mathematician where they use methods from uh, automorphic form to construct the graphs. And then there's something called the Jamanujan conjecture where you say something about the coefficient of a, a modular form, for example. And then that's how you, you they, they have user estimate to, to show that these graphs are Jamanujan. So that's why they call the term Jamanujan. Um, so here we classify own Jamanujan generalized Paley graphs. There are eight cases here. The first case is D to eight. And then you have four times P, where P is three mod four, or you have eight P. Uh, I missed a case where D could be uh, just a prime number. And you could have four times P1 times P2, but then the P1 and P2 are restrained by these conditions. And then you could eight times P1, P2, and also we have some conditions. And in the case where just two prime number, then you have also some restrained conditions. So, so using the, the prime number theorem, for example, you can show that eight cases happen infinitely many times. So this gives a construction of an infinite family of, of uh, German region graph. So I think that's all I want to say. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you. Yeah, so I think I, I stopped my presentation here. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So, does anyone have a question to Tom? I guess I have just a quick comment. Yeah. 
um, historical maybe. Uh, so the, well, the fact that it was the first to conjecture that uh, there is no zeros of Fekete polynomials, and then he tried to prove like, that there is no Zigo zero, and then Polya sort of disproved it uh, by constructing these examples that you mentioned. But the interesting story is that, um, so my internet was cutting out. I'm not sure, uh, maybe you, you mentioned it, but um, the interesting story is like 20 years later after Fekete, Chola again conjectured that they do not have fact that polynomials do not have zeros. And in a year after, Helbron disproved it in a pretty much unaware of previous works in, the, in exactly the same way as Polya. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is sort of you're in a good company that uh, when you check. Uh, I see. Yes, okay. so this is one thing. And another his sort of maybe a comment as well that um, actually in the paper of what you say, Poonen, it's a Granville Sound. Ponre and Poonen, uh, uh, sorry, not Poonen, um, yeah, Poonen. Yep. Uh, yeah, right. So they actually uh, get the exact constant. They don't compute it, but they prove that ah. there is exactly a constant C, which is bigger than 50%, such yep. that every effect of polynomial has C asymptotically C times P0. Exactly. And this constant C is coming actually from, well, one can identify that something which comes from random process, which mm. uh, connected to Mahler measure and so on. Like, yeah, that just- sure. Thank you, yes. But thanks for the very nice talk. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, I wonder some time ago whether we can do the same thing for the constant for the general forgive binomials. But my co-author and I is not an analytic number theory, so we can't reluctant to work on that project. So maybe you can, can work on that project so, for right. Sort of if you look at the paper that appeared on archive today, huh? About fact at the polynomials. Um, oh, there's one about this? Yeah. So this actually proves uh, something about the random process which governs the behavior. It computes Mahler measure. Oh, I see. Very interesting. Yeah, I think and check. also yeah, all the distribution. Yeah, all the distributional property. And from this, you can probably do, or for, yeah, so you can probably do something about the zeros of of other of generalized polynomials. I see. Yeah, thank you. That's very very good to know. Yeah. I, uh, thank you for a great talk. Do you have uh, at least a sequence of? Uh, these polynomials that you know they're irreducible, at least irreducible, not even you know biggest Galois group. Uh, so that's a great question. And so, so my friend Shiva, he well, that's why I invented he invited him to this project. And so he said that in check math you can check whether polynomial over Z, but the, the degree have to be restricted. So the only way we know how to do it irreducible is that you take taking reducible mod, mod Q, and now we can I can do for for bigger P. So we don't if you don't care about Gagu, we can do for bigger P. Uh, but there's one instruction in the K where the discriminant is square, then it can be reducible mod Q for any Q. So you cannot use modular technique in that case. So you have to consider the whole Gagu group in order to say that it's reducible. So uh, my, my quick answer that I can check that if usable for bigger value of P, I think could be 2000, 3000, uh, but I don't have an, a proof. So that, okay, there is an infinite family of P that is reducible. That's that I don't know how to do. Yeah, that's great questions. Yeah, there, there, there are many ways of proving that polynomials are irreducible, but none of it is yeah. easy, so to speak. Yeah. You yeah, might I, want to talk to Marco Fosieta. He is, I think oh. the best uh, expert on irreducibility of polynomials. Oh, can you can you write the name of that mathematician? Uh, yeah, I can put in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, I, I it's another comment that I think uh, it's a difficult question. Uh, so I think people have thought about that about irreducibility, mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, I don't think that anything is known because all these like criteria is like sort of like Eisenstein's and maybe shifting something and uh, these ones they're kind of character is too random in some 
tense. Well, I, I, I would probably want to look if this is a prime, uh, like where the roots are in periodic numbers, because you can get a pretty good idea, kind of asymptotic expansion where they are. Whether you can translate this into actual proof of irreducibility, hard to say. But I mean, there are structures. So whenever mm -hmm. there is structure, one has hope. Yeah, in particular, the structure of Gauss sums like that you have. Exactly, in the exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I failed, <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, one but, thing I can say is that uh, you take the reduction mod P, for example, with B divided by N, then it has a factorization. So very large factor of X minus one. So you can say that if you irreducible, then one of the factors have to be have a degree big by the general Einstein, Einstein criteria. But, but that's, that's actually good. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good start, actually, I think. Yeah. So in the case where B is just prime number, I think we prove that the X minus one have multiplicity B minus three over two or B minus one over two, one of those numbers by Y. Mm -hmm. And the Mahler measure is fairly small, right? Probably yeah, small, yeah, right? Yeah. Square root well, of I, kind of small, actually, right? It's actually 0 0.74083 square root of p. Perfect. It's square root Perfect. of p. As, as of today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that reduces the number of factors, right? A bit, but not much. But not much. Yeah, it's square root. So the order is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still growing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for a great talk. Yeah, thank you yeah, very much for your questions. All right. Uh, I guess I'll stop the recording now and then anyone else.